All right, and you are live. Well, good evening, and welcome to the Commemorative Air Force Warbird Tube webinar for this evening. I'm your host, Steve Buss, and very glad that you could join us tonight. Uh, and, you know, we really uh, are looking forward to tonight's uh, presentation. It's uh, about a, a World War II era film called Journey to Royal, and we'll introduce our guests in just a moment. But we'd like to remind you that the webinar series is made possible by the Commemorative Air Force. You can support the CAF by visiting our website, commemorativeairforce.org. Support us by becoming a member or making a donation to help keep our airplanes and our educational programs continue. And remember, commemorativeairforce.org. Joining me tonight, Chris Johnson and Mariana Tosca, who have created a wonderful film, a World War II era film called Journey to Royal. Chris and Mariana, welcome to the uh, welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you so, so much, much for having us. Pleasure well, to be here. Let's let's start with a little background on, on both of you, so we'll get to know you a little bit. Uh, Mariana, how did how did you get involved in uh, in filmmaking? Um, just, I'm sorry, in filmmaking or with this particular film? Well, in in filmmaking in general, and then in in uh, this uh, particular film. Uh, well, I've been an actor for a very long time, and um, also a a social activist. And it was actually through my social activism that I came to meet Chris. Um, I was on a panel of uh, experts at a film about the plight of captive elephants, um, with which I was peripherally involved. And after the screening, Chris came up and asked me if there was some way he could help because he had been so moved by the film that he'd just seen. And so uh, it was, Chris, was it a week or two weeks after that? We found ourselves- About, about two weeks. Two weeks well, after that. We found ourselves- um, Trans, uh, transporting a family of uh, chimpanzees from a defunct laboratory to a sanctuary in Florida. And on that trip, Chris had told me about um, this, this occurrence with his uh, great uncle close to the end of the war in which um, he had lost his life while saving the lives of nine downed airmen. And the more I learned about this story, uh, the more I realized that I wanted to make sure the legacy of these people was not forgotten. Um, the, the fourth emergency rescue squadron, which is the squadron that our, our film revolves around, um, these young men, and they were young men between 18, 22, 23 years old, uh, were in one of the most dangerous theaters of the war and they were flying, um, to, my, to my knowledge, they had removed um, a lot of their armament because they needed to make room for the injured that they would be bringing on board their PBYs. So they had their sidearms on them, but they didn't really have a lot of ammunition to protect themselves from Zeros or submarines or enemy fire. And when the I heavy, learned, I'm sorry? The, the heavy armament, like the 50 caliber uh, machine guns that would be out the back blisters of a PBY or in the nose or the tail, like a lot of that, a lot of that they didn't see it, see a need for. So that, yeah, that those, those bits of armament would be removed. And, and so when I, when I heard about this and the more I thought about that, these, these young men spent the entirety of their wartime service in the pursuit of saving lives and not taking them. And uh, that concept to me just, uh, it just resonated through me and I wanted to make sure that I was a part of preserving their history for future generations. So that's how I jumped on board. And uh, Chris, how about you? Um, well, I, I've been, it's sort of this stereotypical story. I've been interested in filmmaking almost literally since I could walk because my father used to shoot Super 8 movies and no joke, no joke, as a child, I used to figure out how to build projectors or, or optical printers or make spaceships fly. I was shooting my own Super 8 movies, really, when I was six years old, seven, eight years old. And that, that never went away. And then it evolved a little bit. I became fascinated with the process of makeup effects. And the process of makeup effects got me my first professional job in Hollywood, uh, doing makeup for films like Drop Dead Fred or Last of the Mohicans. And then that that was my college. That was my education into you know, watching Michael Mann direct. What better school is there than watching one of the master auteurs of film? Um, and so 
I took that knowledge that I learned from those those films, and I kept working in visual effects and makeup. But then I sort of segued into making my own pictures, and they were smaller pictures. I did three uh, lower budget pictures, and that was really they weren't college films; they were legit films. But I, I kind of view them as my you know my college era films, and they're what I really learned um, uh, about the the. the intricacies of all the processes involved and you know this is this is just a, an extension of that really glorious education into the process uh every film i think any filmmaker would tell you any film is just another learning process um new techniques new approaches and this film is the culmination of a lifetime of love for the craft you know so uh, and then specifically journey to royal like mariana had said uh my great uncle was a topic of family reunions ever since i can remember and when his widow would arrive my cousin who it was the spitting image of royal uh his his um his grandson and whenever he would arrive royal's widow would burst into tears because it was like he was walking into the room and i being at that age had no comprehension of what that loss had meant to her. And as we, we know now from the picture, it, it affected generations of my family. And so I wanted to fill in the gaps in our family chain by honoring his service, by learning about what brought about his ultimate fate. And it, this this film is uh, that the culmination of that ultimate desire and so Marianne and I've worked for a decade to get to all of the people who knew Royal and the squadron that are alive and and we visited them and they became part of our extended family and um, the film of course there's a million steps in making a movie but that's the sort of the overall uh, how this whole thing came came to be well it, and it's an interesting concept that that you took to telling this story, there's there are really two elements uh, of the film. If you've not seen it yet, I, uh, Amazon Prime is is a great place to go see it. Uh, but there's the this the the story of of Royal and his mission and uh, the Dragon Lady crew uh, B twenty nine that gets that gets uh, shot down. Uh, and, and then there's also, as you mentioned, the the sort of documentary aspect of the veterans who are telling the stories and and their memories. Of of being the Pacific at at the end of World War II, so let's let's kind of start. We've got some stills here from from the movie. Let's have you kind of talk us through the the, the beginning of the film and 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 how this the mission gets set up. Sure. The our our feeling from the very beginning was we knew, you know, when we would talk about documentaries versus feature films. Uh, if you're in the business at all, one of the one of the things that scares you the most about doing a documentary, I think, is the idea of sort of diet cokeish reenactments, and you know, not not to um, you know speak ill of any any efforts out there, but we just I know that we wanted our approach to be different, and so from very early on, we decided that we had to have an immersive experience. And the way to do that was to put the audience directly in the cockpits of these circumstances so that they could be a participant as much as possible through film. Uh, and then the documentary, sorry, Mara. I was just going to say, and I might add that um, for both of us, the importance of uh, fidelity to accuracy, it, it was paramount because we had a duty to the members of the fourth ERS to make sure that uh, we were representing what they did in as truthful a way as possible. And so there was a, a there was a pressure when you make a film, there's a pressure to make sure that, you know, thousands of elements come together and coalesce into a final project. But in this particular film, the pressure was even greater because we had to match the high bar that was already set by the veteran service itself. And 
So everything that you see in the film is taken from 10 years of research, um, from accident reports, from firsthand accounts from the people who were there and either uh, witnessed an event or were actually a part of a, a rescue. Um, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Chris. I just I no. really wanted to make sure that everybody knew that when you're in the cockpit of that B-29 going down, um, what you're seeing and hearing is actually as close as we could um, come to what was happening in, in the moment. I mean, in, in literal terms, and, and this isn't all that glamorous, but uh, I know we would break up duties. I mean, Mariana at one point was researching hairstyles, haircuts, <laughs> the, the way, the way, what, what material did they use in their hair to, you know, during service. Uh, I was studying stitch patterns in rafts and glue patterns in May Wests, uh, things, things like that, because all of those things, those we had to create, that look and that atmosphere from nothing. We had these wonderful performers and they came in as these sort of young blank slates and we had to uh, build the world around them so that they could be immersed and react as if they were in the moment as much as possible. Now that's what, that's, the, that's pretty standard for filmmaking, right? That's, that's, the, that's what you do. But when you're a smaller picture and you're trying to go back to 1945 without the Steven Spielberg budget. You know, it, it fell on Mariana and I to make sure that, again, where it was humanly possible to, to cross the T's and dot all the I's that, that we could. And I just want to add for anyone who actually uh, buys the DVD um, or the Blu-ray, on that disc, there is a 12 minute featurette and you can access it through the, the home main page, um, but it's called Chasing Clouds and it's the making of Journey to Royal. And when Chris was talking about his research into the stitching of the Mae West vests and the actual stencils on the, the live rafts, um, Chris's history, his, his work history is that he was an Imagineer at Disney for a very long time. And so his, he, he was able to bring skills that he had honed over a decade at this very prestigious um, organization. And our film benefit, benefited greatly from those skills. And if you watch this uh, behind the scenes doc or featurette, you'll see Chris actually um, creating the by from by hand from scratch the May West Life Fest and the life wraps that you see in the film. That's all his handiwork, and it's. I mean, I've been working with him on this for ten years, and I am still completely gobsmacked by you know his um, his artistry and the ability for for him to actually create what he did. Um, so. Well, that's, I, that's a very generous, but I mean, you, that makes it sound like I single hand, like that's not the case at all. Uh, I mean, what she doesn't tell you is that she and the one of the associate producers, the two of the associate producers, Glenn, Glenn Rossney, Glenn, Glenn Rossney and Nick Newbrand, Newbrand, who were invaluable. Uh, we were that we were a small cadre, and we we approach all of these things and, and, and on occasions the crew would expand. But so, yeah, I might've been a point person in terms of like how to literally do some of these things, but in terms of executing it, uh, we, we sort of had our own little <laughs> production squadron for lack of a better. Um, and then we would tackle each of these things because in it, it, like you think about a life raft and you think, oh yeah, it's a life raft. But when you get into the details about it, like how many bands, what, how many feet, how many people, what's the weight ratios, what are the stamps, what are the, what, what are the star patterns, the glue pattern, like these are all things that you want to, that, that, that are, were important to us because we didn't want any of it to, 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 to give away the fact that it wasn't contemporaneous. You know, uh, I don't, you know, the thing I think about is that, that's that scene in the end of Somewhere in Time where Christopher Reeve has made it back 
1912 and he pulls out the penny from 1978 and it destroys his the, the whole illusion of his world and we didn't we didn't want any of those little easter eggs in there to yank people out of the experience and and ruin it for them so we pay, we were very diligent about that well as we're looking at at some of the stills from from the film um this is uh, royal stratton himself uh, that's the actor who plays the actor play, right who plays who plays it was very striking resemblance to the original uh but it it starts with the the b-29 being shot down the crew is not exactly sure where they are and they're, they're really hoping and praying that the uh the, the rescue squadron will find them and that's that's kind of the turning point of the the uh the uh the feature portion of the film, I guess, is is the, the them going to look for them and knowing that not only this particular B twenty nine crew, but it's sort of representative of many many other rescues that took place in the in the uh, Pacific. Absolutely, you're you're absolutely right in that. In fact, the film itself is a kind of a placeholder for many of the untold stories and the smaller stories that that don't get told. Um, and we've heard that from different people that people who who are Vietnam veterans or Korean Korea the Korean War veterans, uh, even um, Afghanistan or Desert Storm, there's a relatability to the veteran experience and what veterans sacrifice. You know, so uh, but but you're absolutely right. The turning point, the prologue is kind of the hook, and that allows us to segue into the uh, meeting my, my grandfather, who's Royal's brother, and sort of setting the stage for that hometown feel and that the contemporaneous version is going to be our, our journey to meet the people that ultimately fill out the entire story. And uh, you, you took great care in, in setting the scene. Uh, and, and putting the viewer back in 1945. Uh, that was, I, I, I believe a very deliberate uh, it, uh, thought on, on, on your po- on, on your part to, to do that to really uh, take us back to to what that era was like to what it felt like what it sounded like what it looked like and I was very taken by that in in watching the film I've I've been around Warbirds a number of years and and I've I've talked to veterans and so I I have a sense of what the 40s were like but this film really kind of it made that more real than I, than I had experienced before. I'm so glad that you said that. And that was actually one of the reasons why there's a, there's a section that's dedicated to the Hollywood canteen in the film. And that was the real reason why we put the, we included that in here is because we wanted to give the audience kind of a, a broad uh, view of life, you know, uh, before these, young men shipped out what they did, what they, you know, how they were preparing, what the, what their communities felt like, um, what um, people in the Hollywood, you know, uh, studio system, how they were supporting the efforts. We wanted to give like a pretty broad stroke to show, um, well, in truth, how, how different things were back then. There was an, in my estimation, there was more of a sense of um, kind of a, a coming together, a, a unity um, that we were all kind of joined together despite any, you know, political background, any belief system, any, you know, d- despite people's upbringings, we all kind of just banded together to, um, to overcome adversity and, so we wanted to make sure that that was included in the film. So I'm, I'm awfully glad that you brought that up. And I think time gives this, you know, we can only reference things through either what we read or see now, right? Obviously. And Very so- good Very good point. So the history of this, I think tends to have this sort of Norman Rockwell, sort of Rockwellian veneer, uh, you know, and so, Part, you know, there's, there's stereotypical ways to do that. And there's artist, you know, some of that is there are artistic ways to sort of transport people into that. And that's, you know, through the, the, the coloring and the, and the feel and the sound and the grain texture. I mean, there's a lot of subconscious things that you make uh, conscious decisions to 
effectuate in filmed filmic storytelling. And so all of the things that Mariana just mentioned, you know, we we landed on what we wanted that those section, sections to feel like, and then we went about designing what is evocative of those feelings in terms of like literal color palettes and like I said, green texture and, and things of that nature. And the other aspect that um, that she hit on, I think is, is part, is the anchor of the picture is that that section allows you to realize that these are just people like you or me, and they were just in, living their lives in a world headed toward a cliff that nobody knew about. And then when that thing happened, all of these people that we've been introduced to suddenly are thrust into these very demanding situations at an age that is incomprehensible, uh, I think, to most people living today. And one of the uh, interesting things, too, about the film is uh, the actors that, that you're using, uh, there were no big names or familiar faces, which really, I think, brought home the, the idea that these were just normal, normal young men doing what they needed to do and being put in very difficult circumstances. And uh, just, and I know sometimes Hollywood can go over the top on, on stories, but this story didn't need any embellishment. It, it was, it's dramatic and compelling enough on its own without any uh, embellishments. And, and, and I think that's one of the things I really enjoyed about it as well. I'm really glad that, that it landed with you that way. Um, so there's two parts to this, right? There's the part that is trying to honor literally the, the specific people that we're representing in the picture, okay? And then there's the filmic technical approach to the thing where, you know, and Mariana will speak to this in a minute about how many, like, you know, she'll speak to the, the casting process and what that was like. But let's say you have carte blanche, right? And you could, you could hire any person in the world to, to work on your picture, right? It, it's a disservice to overshadow the veterans with a performance, okay? The story is not about these performers and we love all of them. They, they, these are great uh, people that, that, that are dedicated to the process of making pictures and acting and, and, and craft, but it was never about that. This was all about honoring the people that the story was truly about. And so to that end, uh, Mariana, I mean, you want to speak to to your approach to to casting this thing. I mean, she handled all of this and 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 screen. Well, please. Well, yes. Um, I was just as you were speaking, I was thinking um, because you said we didn't want to do a disservice to the veterans, and that's not to uh, that's not to say that films like Midway that do have uh, a listers in them aren't spectacular. Because I adore that film. I think it's so beautifully made and I could watch it on a loop forever. Um, but for our story, uh, we did want to keep it um, as, um, as simple as possible and truthful in the sense that when we were interviewing these veterans, the, one of the things that really I found so remarkable was that, and it was across the board with all of them, there was no arrogance. There was no pomp and circumstance with them. It was, there, was, there was such a profound sense of humility when they were explaining and, and going back in time and remembering with great accuracy, I might add, the intricate details of, of their service. And it was just remarkable to me because hearing the stories, you know, even when I think about them, I get... I can feel my, myself percolating on the inside because the, the, the heroism that all of these wonderful young men uh, were a part of is, is something that I'll probably never experience personally in my life. But in their retelling of it, there was just, for them, it was just their duty. They were just doing their duty and they were doing it to the best of their ability. I'm looking at that gorgeous face of Lyle Umenhoff right there. Ah, uh, I just yes, yeah, so 
Indianapolis survivor. I just loved him. Lyle was a survivor of the USS Indianapolis. And being in his presence was one of the most profoundly uh, soulful and fulfilling uh, experiences. I'll come back to him in a second, but I did want to answer or speak to what Chris was talking about with the casting process. Um, I had sent out a casting notice for all of the, the breakdown for all of the characters in our um, cinematic recreation segments. And 1,500 people submitted their videos, uh, their audition reels. 1,500, which is, <laughs> it's an overwhelming response. But um, for, for, for 20 roles. For, exactly, for 20 roles. Um, and but I wanted to make sure that I honored every one of these people that submitted. So I, I watched every reel that came in and I watched it uh, wanting to give each of them a part in the film, but we had to narrow it down to roughly about 50 that, and, and we brought those guys in for the final uh, audition process and then the callbacks. And so we were looking for, first and foremost, people who could act, obviously. Um, we needed people who fit the, physically fit the role, who were in the right age group, um, and also people who, who could, uh, for lack of a better term, put up with our production schedule and, uh, you know, who would not be like claustrophobic in a cockpit of a PBY, because I don't know, obviously a lot of people who are watching this know what I'm talking about. Those spaces are very cramped. And with camera equipment and crew and lighting and, you know, it gets very, very tight in there. So we needed to make sure that people would be able to um, uh, suffer through, uh, you know, all of the logistical aspects of filming um, and, and being out on the open ocean. We had to make sure that there were people that, you know, could tolerate being out on the open ocean for those, for those scenes. Um, so we did, I think we found the perfect perfect cast for this. And it was so beautiful to watch all of them kind of band together, um, not only as an entire uh, film cast, but actually as a B-29 crew and a PBY crew, because we had two crews that obviously were filming on different days. Um, but to see that kind of morph into a band of brothers on each of those uh, aspects was really, it was, Great fun to watch. And uh, uh, Chris, do you want to add anything to yeah. that? Yes, you know, there's, and, and this isn't a judgment about either type of crew, okay? But obviously the, the, the veterans on the B-29s, their mission parameters were very different than the mission parameters of the guys on the rescue PBYs, right? They were a little scrappy. So, <laughs> yeah, so the, the disposition is the disposition was different. The goals were different, right? So, um, what we found was the B twenty nine crew, the performers that were the B twenty nine guys, they adopted the persona and the sort of clicky kind of, you know, the the, the parameters of the care the, the the people they were portraying. You know, they felt like a bomber crew, mm -hmm. okay? whereas the rescue squadron crew. They were. They had an entirely different disposition. They were and a little they, more swashbuckling. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's, and it's funny when you saw them interface. That it was almost like, and you know, you felt like the real thing. And the beauty of that was um, because we had some training days and things like that, where where they could get up to speed on the stuff. That uh, when we threw them in the environments, those. Um, I guess, behaviors that they had worked on, they really carried through. And I think if there's, this is the best possible case that any filmmaker uh, hopes for, is that those subtleties just read and they believe they're in the moment. So the audience believes that we're in the moment and it doesn't distract from the storytelling. And that's, that's, that's the best, that's kismet. That's the best you could hope for. And there was something else that occurred too. The, the actors, on their um, on the PBY, actually on the B twenty nine in particular, that bunch of actors, that crew, really ended up really falling in love with the aircraft itself, and we couldn't get them out 
of Three Feathers because we filmed on Three Feathers at the Marchfield Air Museum, which is the B-29 that's um, a static exhibit there. Um, but we couldn't get them out. They, they were, the tunnel that it, that leads from, you know, the, uh, the cockpit to the, to the rear gunner, um, they were just constantly crawling through it back and forth. That was like their form of, um, uh, I don't know. It, it wasn't a hazing, what is it, like a, a ritual, a trial by, uh, it's, it's like you had to, pa like you did that to pass muster and, and um, to be part of the, to the group, you know, and anybody who knows the way a B-29 is set up, you've got the pressurized sections of the plane. So you've got the front cockpit and the radio compartment. And then you've got the uh, center gunner control and the uh, radio and all that stuff. And that, that long the tunnel tube, above the bomb bay. Above the bomb bays. That's no small stretch. Mm -hmm. And those guys, those pilots back then were, you know, crews were smaller than, the, than we are today, just by nature of it, uh, of who they selected for those roles. Um, so getting through that as, you know, a six, you know, it's a harrowing experience, especially if you're a little claustrophobic, but these guys took, took to it. it. It was really fun to watch them. They bonded with that plane. Of course, we, we, we bonded with all of the, all of the hardware, the PBY mm -hmm. Harriet's chariot at Palm Springs air museum and, uh, the three feathers at Marshfield air museum. These became extended family. They aren't, they, they aren't machines to us. They are as real as character. They feel like they're living, breathing entities. Um, you, you, you feel it when you're with them. You, the, the, the sense of, uh, it's the spirits. It's the spirits of those who had flown in these aircraft before and the vintage smells and the textures and the, the paint and the hardware, everything in there just it helped the actors get into character because it made things again completely immersive and for us it grounded us in the even more so in the realization that we really needed to get it right uh, for for the veterans who had flown before so um I, we went off on a tangent there. That's but. okay. <laughs> and, and, it, and it actually leads into a, a question one of our, our viewers had is, it, do you think the actors uh, uh, got a, a, a true appreciation for what the veterans had gone through in, in 1945? And I, I believe you've answered that question is they, they did, they, they became a crew. They, they, they really took to, uh, as you said, getting into character, but I think, they, they probably did walk away with a, a true appreciation of, of what it might have been like in, in the late 40s. You know, we still, the film came out this year. Mm -hmm. We were in post, well, COVID hit. So our post-production took longer than it should have. Um, so we wrapped with the guys a few years ago, actually. And we still get uh, emails from them or phone calls from them telling us that to this day, shooting our film and being on our set was, was the pinnacle for them. It was the most, um, it was the most special film or TV uh, shooting experience that they've had because we were, we did become a band of brothers. I mean, we were shooting at Palm Springs Air Museum and at Marsh Field Air Museum. And uh, I mean, it, it, see, it sounds kind of silly, but even the, our lunch breaks were in uh, a mess tent and, you know, yeah, like the guys, the I'm sorry. It was the Quonset hut was the, it was a military, you know, it was like 1945, you know, it had that the curved, it, it was, it, it, it didn't take us out even when we were break taking breaks. In fact, yeah. uh, you, we were shooting on a PBY and uh, we had to break because there was, you know, we're in an airfield, obviously. And Mariana grabbed her camera and opened one of the windows and or ran out. And she got shots. What was flying by? No, 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 no. <laughs> no. I was going to lead into that on a different part of the story. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it. To you. I'll leave it to you then. But, <laughs> but the um, but the thing is, Steve, you can imagine. These aren't, we're not just walking on the sets when we're out on the ocean and these guys are in the life rafts and um, despite, 
you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give anybody away, but a couple, of, a couple of, uh, a couple of our guys out there and me, and me. got a little seat <laughs> there. Um, but they're climbing out of these things into the the blister of the PDY. These, it, this is not a walk and talk show. This is really hardcore moving people into planes, out of planes, in cramped quarters. The stuff in the film, I don't know to an audience whether it looks like it's easy to do or, or not, but none of the stuff that we did on this picture was easy. Yeah. It was all a challenge and different kinds of challenges. A thrilling was, challenge, a thrilling yeah. challenge, but it was definitely not a cakewalk. Um, and you were just talking about this, the scene where uh, John Logan is using his own body as a ladder to help bring the crew up into the blister of the PBY. And for people watching the film, they probably aren't aware that the, the windowsill is not very low. And for somebody who's kind of short, when you're leaning over it, that rim, that, that steel rim is jammed into your rib cage. And to have the weight of people climbing on top of you is, it's not a pleasant experience. <laughs> um, so, that, and in the film, we recognize that, okay, this sequence takes a matter of minutes, right? But anybody that knows anything about film, Trevor Sherwood is the... Uh, is the, the actor who played John Logan. Played John Logan. He hung out uh, the side of that plane for a half a day. Mm -hmm. And so... And did it always, with, with such a wonderful spirit and a smile and never a no, complaint. No complaints, zero. Well, as we were talking about the, the uh, dramatic portion of the, of the film, we alluded to uh, the Indiana, USS Indianapolis survivor, but uh, the, the veteran stories play a very significant role in, in, this, in this film as well. They are the anchor. They yeah. are the truth of the film. You know, the, the film is about them first and foremost and about their stories. Exactly. Uh, and, and perfect time to come up on George Keene. Uh, Pearl Harbor survivor, and uh, we we took the, um, the 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 high points of, of all their stories, and that's what comprises the film. In fact, during some of those dr dramatic sequences, uh, specifically the rescue, you know, we cut to the real John Logan because. As much as showing it through the actors and the, and the, the representation there, uh, we felt it was vitally important, specifically in that instance, to lock in the real people. Because he was the, he was the sole survivor of that particular aspect of the picture. And we wanted him to be a key figure in the actual narrative uh, unfolding of that sequence. Um, so... Every chance we got, we asked ourselves, okay, how do we best represent the stories of the veteran? How do we best honor what they did and complement it in a way that doesn't distract or pull away from the literal words that they're saying in those, in those sequences? I mean, as, as Mariana um, hey, had... Lost her. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> back. Yeah, I don't know how you block calls from happening, but... Um, <laughs> As, as Mariana had said uh, earlier, you know, we, we felt such a, 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 like a part of the family uh, of these different veterans that we spoke to. Um, we wanted to make sure that that feeling came through in the picture and that it was, again, first and foremost about and their storytelling. Exactly. The, the film is, it's a World War II film, but it's not about the violence or the strategy of World War II. It's, it's about a group of young men who did an exceptional thing set against the backdrop of the horrors of that particular theater. And we're looking at a picture of John Ree right now. Ah, uh, I love John Ree. It's so uh, hard to look at these, you know, it, it's hard to look at these photos because you know, we're doing a webinar with you, Steve. And right. um, th the fact is, is that when a picture of John pops up, 
we're still connected to these people. And I'm really sorry, but the idea is that the small thing that we've done here with the picture cements them forever into this history. And so they that, so deserve it. They so, so deserve it. And they're here with us forever. It's, it's, it's almost as if you could reach out and hug this guy. Just you, you, you're never too far from, from feeling his spirit and who he was and what he brought because uh, he just, he brings that and imbues the film, every one of them imbues the film with that spirit of who they were and um, the, the, the courageous thing that they all did. It's, it's profound. We're, 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 there's no better, there's no matter what, either of us do, and I, I, I won't speak for you, but I think I could in saying that no matter what comes after this, this is a, a, a golden touchstone of life to have had the, the, privilege, the privilege to meet these people yes. and to be the custodians of, 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 their, of their history and legacy. That's exactly right. And it was, there was this weird reversal of gratitude, Steve, that happened. I mean, we came in, we were so enthusiastic and so thrilled to be able to uh, archive their stories for for generations to come and invariably we would end up leaving uh, these interviews with these veterans with them telling us how grateful they were for the opportunity that we gave them it was it was kind of uh, it was very very bizarre to me I mean incredibly lovely but I felt like um, that we were the ones in their debt and it, it but I, as it turned out it was kind of beneficial for everyone involved because it was beneficial for us obviously we got the content for our film but it was beneficial for the veterans because they were able to finally tell their stories firsthand and contribute to the preservation of, of world history right but and the, third, the third component to this was the families. The families that were there were so, and, and the vast majority of them, they had never heard these stories before. Their family members had never spoken of their service. And we, we gave them the opportunity to open up in front of their family. So it was kind of palliative in a way for them because their families found a new understanding or a new sense of pride that they hadn't been aware of before. And in some cases, there were, as Chris had said before, um, many times, there was behaviors, perhaps, in, in these veterans that was unexplained. And after hearing their, their interviews and hearing the stories that came out of them, um, there was a greater understanding of why that behavior existed, perhaps. Right. And... And it's it really kind of, it's kind of beautiful to see the softening of, you know, in one case, the family members hadn't been in the same room with each other for years. And when we were able to bring them all together, um, by the end of it, several hours later, you could see a, a softening of the, the rigidity that might have been there in the beginning. So, I mean, what a profound privilege for us to have been a, a catalyst in that. Um, as Chris was saying, no matter what comes from this, I'll always, always be incredibly proud of the fact that that we that we did that we did this. Oh. Yeah. Well, and and it, your 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 thoughts and sentiments that that you're expressing now about how the veterans opened up to uh, essentially a stranger yes. uh, is the same as what. We hear from our uh, the CAF's touring aircraft, the, the uh, uh, B-17 or B-29 or even some of the smaller aircraft will go to an airport and invariably a veteran will come out and begin telling his story. And the family just is enthralled because they've never heard grandpa mm -hmm. say these things before. And it took the airplane or in your case, uh, the film to be able to bring that out and to bring that that not only to preserve the story, but also to bring that story to the family that, that for whatever reason, you know, the greatest generation just kind of came home and went back to work and they just 
went back with with life and a lot of the stories just never got shared so to be able to to bring that uh, closure uh, for the family uh, through the film or through the airplanes is just uh, an amazing an amazing thing it really is and this was foundational in our our understanding early on and mariana spoke to this a little bit um in the beginning our enthusiasm uh as genuine as it was we recognized after the first couple people that we reached out to um that we needed to we need Reel to it in. <laughs> I didn't know how to say it, you know, without, you know, I, I, it's not that we were being inappropriate, but what you realize very quickly is that in many cases, you're asking these people, elderly people, to mm-hmm. relive some of the most horrifying, if not the most horrifying experiences of their life. And so for them to do that is emotionally and physically taxing. And so there's a responsibility on our part to treat that with care and compassion and not to go in as the eager beaver filmmakers, you know, to present like, Oh, Hey, it's, you know, we're here to, to hear your story because it's just, you, you recognize that the gravity uh, of the things that they are about to talk about that it, it, it just, that would be a misplaced way, you know, to, to go into a situation. Um, so, that was the other thing is that we took our cue from the disposition of the people that we would go see. And so we tried to, to be candid, we tried to mirror their energy so that they felt as comfortable as possible and that they could reveal as much as they were comfortable revealing. And um, in many cases, once, once we sort of took off together, uh, the sky was the limit because they knew that we weren't there to hurt them or to misrepresent or paint them in a light that was, was different than they had perceived themselves. Our, st- our goal was to get to the heart of their truth, of their experience. And so we were, we were their biggest cheerleaders and uh, biggest supporters. And, uh, and they, all, they all just stepped up and, and, and took us along for the ride. And, you know, I know this is what you're talking about when you say a veteran comes to your plane, they take a ride on Fifi or another one of your planes, and suddenly they're transported, and that, that gives them the catalyst and the reason to talk about something that otherwise they wouldn't necessarily talk about. And our film was, as you said, it was that sort of catalyst that gave them the excuse to talk about something that they, they normally... because. As Mariana said, in every case, the, the modesty, the humility, and, and and obviously some of the horror of what they'd experienced was something that they had compartmentalized and decided, yeah. for the most part, we're not going to talk about this anymore because um, looking forward in life is 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 easier than looking back at that. And then it can- but strangely, what you were just saying about car- compartmentalizing, it is true, but like with the case of Lyle Umenhofer, who was the USS Indianapolis survivor, I was, I was just so overwhelmed by his um, generosity of, of spirit in wanting to share his, his story um, as vividly <laughs> as possible. He, there, um, the details that we got about his experience were just remarkable. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because you can separate, like intellectually, you know what they did, uh, you know what they experienced, you've heard stories about it, but to get it directly from them firsthand takes it to a whole other level. And, you know, to learn about how he rolled off the top of the ship after the first torpedo hit and he was just floating around in oil until six in the morning without knowing there was anyone near him. And then he had having to swim out and find other guys who were in little pods and um, the, the barracuda and the sharks that were just ubiquitous, just constantly bumping up against him the entire time they were in the water, unrelenting. Um, It's, and then of course being rescued by PBY and Adrian Marks. Um, it's, you know, to hear it firsthand from him was really, 
it's an experience I'll, I'll never ever forget and one that I'll cherish. Um, I mean, who, who hasn't, right? Who hasn't seen Jaws and listened to Quint <laughs> do right. his monologue about right. US Indianapolis? Right. And, you know, Robert Shaw, great actor, and, you know, Jaws, you're out on the ocean. So you kind of get a feel for what that's like. So, I mean, we've all heard it told in dramatic sense. Uh, but to sit in front of the guy that literally was in the water for five yeah. Years, yeah. and talk about salt blisters and yeah. every, like, you just, your, your jaw hits the floor. And, you, and, you just got, yeah. It, and watching guys swallow the salt water and within an hour lose their lucidity and just being plucked and just plucked away. And things, things that, that wouldn't feel right to say in the context of a, of a conversation like this, because not only are they, they're hard and they're personal, but you're just the richness of the co complete way that, that, those people, especially Lyle, spoke about those things. Those are indelible. No matter what book we may read about the USS Indianapolis, nothing will come close to the sound of his voice, saying the words and seeing it in his eyes, what he went through. It chokes me up just thinking about it now because nothing in our lives is going to come close to being in the open ocean for five days and not knowing your fate. Nothing. It's yeah. What a rarefied circumstance that we were able to cross paths and sit in the room with that guy. And even more rarefied, Steve, because as we were leaving that day, I had fallen completely in love with Lyle Lumenhofer. I mean, my heart was pounding being in the room with him. He was just so adorable. Um, but when we left, I said, Lyle, we're going to come back and we're going to take you out for the day. We're going to go to Descanso Gardens and spend the day. It's, um, it's a, a beautiful park near here. Um, and he said, you know, I, I don't like to go out much these days. I like to stay home. And, and I talked to my wife a lot who had passed the year before. And we said our goodbyes. And I had felt like we had made such a, a wonderful connection. And I couldn't, I was so looking forward to just visiting him again and he had told us his complete story and it felt like he had not unburdened himself. That's, that's a too dramatic a term, but he had, um, he had handed over to us as custodians, his story, because I do believe that he knew he trusted that we would tell it as truthfully as possible and that we would honor his legacy. And Lyle passed away two days after that. And I can't help but think, I can't help but think that maybe there's, there was some part of him that said, okay, I, uh, I can put a period at the end of this chapter. And uh, anyway, I, I loved Lyle. I yeah. thought it was remarkable. And, and following at that thought, he had, uh, he had transferred the story to the next generation. He had he had told his story, and he knew it would it would live on beyond beyond him, um, which is I, I, I can't even imagine. First of all, what he had gone through, or th I'm mis thinking maybe some sense of of relief or accomplishment that he'd been able to document what he had gone through, so that it would live on beyond him. I have to agree with you. That's yeah. that's what it felt like. And uh, again, like we said earlier, it was a privilege to be yeah. a part of that. Well, this is interesting because we, we started out talking about a movie <laughs> and now we're talking about veterans and we're, we're rapidly approaching the, the hour mark. Um, but uh, one of the things that, that I do want to talk about is uh, the airplanes, because of course we're the CAF is airplane people. Yeah. Um, but you have some interesting techniques for uh, actually uh, filming I, I guess you still call it film, even though it's 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 digital. Mm -hmm. But um, the miniatures that you used in the film uh, were very amazing and and very very uh, credible. I, and uh, just, there is no yeah. CGI in the right. Film. There's no CGI. Yeah. Everything that you see is practical effects. 
um, or like composite imagery. Yeah. And the, once again, the, uh, the ex imagineer uh, <laughs> wizardry that is Chris Johnson uh, spent 16 hours a day, seven days a week for six months, handcrafting a five foot wingspan PBY and a three foot wingspan B29 to the most exacting detail, including flack and mm-hmm. bugs on the windshield. I mean, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> It is. Yeah, it is. And and as an airplane guy, I before the before the movie drew me in completely and and I stopped thinking about those sorts of things. Um the the looking at the airplanes, I was first of all trying to figure out how did they do that? Because I know there's not that many B-29s flying. Mm-hmm. What PBY were they using? Where did mm-hmm. they film this? And then once the, the story uh, got me i didn't think about it again but um to see these miniatures and if, if you look at the picture that's on the screen right now if you take the bottom half out <laughs> that's a b-29 flying in over you know over the southern california mm-hmm. the, the, it's absolutely incredible so uh, hats off to you uh, chris that's uh and well, um, you, you know see, you one of these yeah so no, and there's Before, various yeah. this is this is the actual this is an, an actual PBY, yes, right? Harry Museum. Yes. Yep. And then I just like what you've done. I mean, this is before. That's the that's what we call in film that that's the plate shot, plate shot. which right. is the live action that we shoot on location with Harriet's chariot. And then this is the combination with the models and the digital background. The digital back, and when I say that, the digital background is basically a digital painting with duplicates of the PBY with different numbers on the front right. and the different model airplanes. And, and part of that is actually a shot of the real Iwo Jima from World War II, because in every instance, we tried to incorporate some element of the actual event uh, so that, that for us, there was a grain of authenticity in every single Uh, shot that we did Uh, but this for example you know you said something that I think uh, that 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 I'm so thrilled that you said that we started off talking about a movie and we ended up talking about that right so that is the that is the model of what this film is supposed to represent okay and to to, to extend that even further you're talking about models that 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 took you know the PBY took six months the B29 took an additional three three months um, and the, they're, the rivets on those are hand rolled. Every salt water fleck on that's a, a brush dab. Mm-hmm. And every, I, I mean this sincerely, I would have vintage music on, you know, contemporaneous to the era. And I would be sitting there working on some specific aspect of it, thinking that every little bit that, that added to the, 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 the believability, I was going to say very similar but that's such a, such a, a Hollywood overused catchphrase, but, but the <laughs> believability and the, the authenticity of those moments, every single detail was one more thing that supported the veteran story. And I felt that in my heart. And so I, I, I never grew tired. I, and this wasn't just for me. You could see it. Mariano's the same. The other people on the crew were the same. They adopted our enthusiasm by extension for these veteran stories. And that's why when you when you look at these things uh, and 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 very generously compliment them, um, it's due to the veterans that the hours and the time and all of that love was put into every detail of every aspect that that we that we could. Well, we've just uh, a, a couple of moments left. Um, some final thoughts from from both of you about. The, the, the journey to, uh, to Royal and the, the journey to the, the film itself? Um, well, I, I, we, I'm not sure, Steve. Uh, we have three Blu-rays that we wanted to, to uh, offer to people for... I'm not sure if, if there's like... A, 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 is, it a, is it a raffle or is it a... I, I think what we'll do is uh, anyone who is, who's watching tonight and is interested in uh, being in a drawing, 
uh, just uh, put something in the comment section that that uh, that you're interested in. We'll we'll do a random drawing for that's those great, uh, for those blue rays. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, gosh, final thoughts. Uh, if, if I, I hope everybody, ooh, sorry about that. I, I, <laughs> I hope everybody watching um, has enjoyed the hour with us. We've loved being on here with you, Steve. This was really a treat. So thank you. Um, if you do end up watching the film, we would love to hear from you. We'd love to know what you think about it. So don't be shy. Go to the website, Journey to Royal, and hit us up in the contacts. Um, if you want to purchase a Blu-ray or DVD, you can do it through the shop at um, Chris Johnson. Right, no, no, it's right on. There's a button right at the bottom of the Journey to Royal page. Get your signed Blu-ray or DVD. And um, there are other places you can get it, but those specific buttons will uh, order from us directly. And we like to, you know, we personalize them. And so send a message along. And if there's anything you want us to say, it's just another way for us to make it as personal as the whole thing is. And uh, we, we love to be able to, to, to be able to do that for people that, that the film resonates with. And if we have 30 seconds, 30 seconds left, I just want to sure. jump back to uh, when I cut Chris off so rudely. Yep. And I said, don't, 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 don't tell. <laughs> um, this is just a quick story. So we're in the cockpit. Well, not in the cockpit. We're in the, where the radio, the radar operator is, or radio operator is uh, in the PBY. And we're staring out that window. And we're shooting that way. And it's a very tense scene. And there's danger imminent. They're in, flying in enemy territory. And our actors are really, really in the moment. And there happened to be an air show at the Bob Springs Air Museum that day. <laughs> <laughs> so we're filming out the window and Trevor, once again, is just staring out the window, looking for enemy planes. And right at that moment, from the from the air show, a Japanese Zero flies by. The <laughs> it was so fantastic. And then when we were loading out that day, uh, taking all the equipment out, um, the president had flown into Palm Springs, and he had parked Air Force One right next to adjacent to the Air Museum. And so we had just experienced this Japanese zero crossing the window. And then when we were leaving, Air Force One was out there. And I thought, okay, well, we covered both sides. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wasn't going to let you get away without, uh, without telling that story. <laughs> and I, I think from my end, the quick closing thought about the, the whole thing is, and much like the commemorative Air Force, you guys are a family, right? And right. There's, there's all veterans and, and historic aviation and stuff. Um, I, I hope that our efforts on this has given us uh, an honorary place in the greater family of people who seek to preserve and honor the, those who have sacrificed to allow us the, the life we have today. And so um, thank you really for, for including us and, and allowing us to talk about the picture and the veterans. And um, it's, it, it it, that, that heartwarming feeling of sitting in front of the veterans, it, it just, it's expansive when I, when, when I think about being able to be uh, part of, part of a, an audience with the commemorative Air Force or the Veterans Administration. And I know Mariana feels uh, the same way. So we're, we're just thrilled that, that this has given us a sort of a, an ability to, to interface in a meaningful way with, with those groups of people. And if the film resonates with anyone and they, they enjoy it as much as we hope they do, please, please spread the word about it. Not because we want our film to be seen, although we do, mm -hmm. but more importantly, because we don't want their stories to be forgotten. We want to make sure that, uh, that the film has legs so that we can contribute to the preservation of history um, without getting lost in the shuffle of all these tentpole films and all the bigger, you know, sexier, high budget things. So if, if you do, if the film resonates with you, please, please spread the word, tell people, um, and not for us, but for the veterans themselves. So thank you again. Exactly. Yes. Uh, Journey to Royal, um, I, it has my highest recommendation. I, I watched it. I was riveted from, from beginning to end. Um, I know I, I read some of the reviews of, of the, uh, the film itself. Uh, and uh, one of the reviewers, I think, uh, from the Chicago area said, this movie is so riveting. It's not the kind of movie where you start watching it and then you pick up your phone a few minutes into it to look up something that's happened on the screen to see if it's real or not. This is, this is a movie you will stick with. And uh, between the dramatic uh, mission 
uh, of the B-29 and the PBY and the stories of the veterans. Uh, it, it really is It is a very unique and wonderful film, Journey to Royal. Yeah, you can see it on Amazon Prime. Uh, visit the website uh, either way, but uh, please, I, I can't give it my highest uh, enough recommendation. Uh, go see it. It's, it's, uh, it's definitely worth it. So thank you again for joining us for our uh, CAF Warbird Tube webinar. If you have any suggestions for a future guest or a topic you'd like to uh, see us uh, take on, just drop Leah Block a note at media at cafhq.org. And we'll be back next Wednesday night, 7 o'clock and uh, Central Time. Until then, I want to thank our, our guests, Chris and Mariana, for uh, joining us. Go see Journey to Royal, will you? All right. For the <laughs> Commemorative Air Force, I'm Steve Buss. Have a good night. Thank, thank you, you, Leah. Thank you.